that's, that's guilty for just studying, and I, I enjoy studying. But uh, Christmas is the pivotal time. Everything changed at Christmas. It is not the highlight, but it was the beginning of fulfilled promise that was to come, come to, into fruition in the next 33 and a half years. And I know that you all know that. But my, my challenge today is to kind of piggyback off of what I shared last week when Job, who is the first one in the Bible, who recognized, uh, you know, we're sending everything up. We're praying, we're sacrificing, we're worshiping, we're doing everything that we can. And uh, Job was so sensitive of it that the Bible teaches us that he even offered up sacrifices on the behalf of his children. Yet, in the process of doing all that, there was no reciprocation, it seemed like, coming from heaven, from God. And he felt like, okay, you know, what I'm doing doesn't seem to be affecting God. Have you ever felt that way? All the worship, all the praying, all the tithing, all the church attendance, all the work, all the volunteer, all the testifying, all the witnessing, all the helps, all the, all the stuff that I do. Why don't I see heaven reciprocate? Why doesn't God send an angel sometime and help me? I'm doing all this for everybody else. I, I think we all get to that place sometimes where we just get tired and we, get, we struggle with some stuff. And we, we do like Job. He said, I just wish there was a daysman, an umpire, a referee, someone who could call the shots, someone who would not be partial, but someone who would represent both sides fairly with the approval from both sides that they would make a decision on our behalf because we don't seem to be able to do the right things or say the right things or have the right connections that we need to get God to do something about our lives. Now, that's what Job prayed in Job chapter 9 and in Job chapter 23. He said, oh, that there was a daysman, someone that, we, that could put his hand or their hand on God, and while they've got one hand on God, put their other hand on us. And bring us together and there be a connection. That was the first real lament after God told the serpent that out of the woman's seed would come an avenger of the faith. That he would bruise the head of Satan himself or take away the authority that he had stolen from Adam and Eve by deception. So I want to share some things with you and I want, you, I want to begin. I'll never get all this preached. It would take a year of Sunday morning messages just to cover the prophecy. There are, there are actually 2,000 prophecies in the Bible. Now, that's 2,000 prophecies in the, in the Bible that concern the birth, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the return of Jesus Christ. There are 2,000 prophecies. Most of them have already come to pass and are coming to pass right now while well, there's a very few of those 2,000 left remaining, one of them being the rapture of the church, Jesus coming back for his bride. That is the major one or the last one yet to take place uh, concerning. Now, there is the prophecy of the last day outpouring. Those prophecies don't figure in, but there are 2,000 prophecies in the Bible that uh, deal with our redemption, that deal with Jesus Christ coming forth, that deal with eternity in mind, all of those are involving the direct presence and power and purpose of Jesus coming to this earth. Now, concerning today and the message today and next Sunday morning, there are actually 332 prophecies that center around just the birth of Jesus Christ alone. Just the birth of Jesus Christ alone, 332 of them. And uh, every one of them not only came to pass, but every one of them came to pass with exact precision and timing. Not only in timing and precision, but also the exact location. I'll get to this. If I don't, uh, then I'll tell you now. Daniel prophesied, gave 25 prophecies that would take place concerning Jesus' crucifixion. He gave 25 prophecies concerning Jesus' crucifixion and his burial, his death, that would take place in a 72-hour period. Beginning before that happened, he made a prophecy on the exact time, at the exact date, and the exact place when Jesus Christ would make his triumphant entry from the Garden of Gethsemane into the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He gave an exact prophecy 
when it would happen down to the calendar date. You can find this in Daniel chapter 12. He gave the exact time, the exact place, and all the events that would take place. Now this is 800 years before it actually happened. What a mighty God we serve who can look through the telescope of time and they can see every character that's going to be involved in a happenstance that he had already forecasted or prophesied in Genesis chapter 3 to the serpent and to the Eve, to Eve herself that would take place. God strategically and systematically put everything in place to watch over every scripture. That's why the Bible says the word of God will not return unto him void, but it will accomplish exactly what he pleases in the matter where he sends it. Now, this is what I want to do. I want to share with you something. We all know that Jesus Christ could not be born from human flesh, or he would not have been able to, to basically deliver us because he also would have the toxic, uh, toxic sin in his life. So God knew this, and he prophesied that out of the woman's seed. Now, that's been a mystery to us all through the years. 6,000 years have come and gone, and it still is a mystery. The greatest, one of the greatest struggles that we have is how in the world can there be a virgin birth? We stumble on that, and we always have stumbled on that. And the closer we get to the end of time, we're finding out that even 63% of Protestant believers who are in the ministry today, 63 Protestant ministers across the world do, do not believe in the virgin birth as it is written and as it is recorded. So the longer, the closer we get to the end of time and Jesus rapturing the church and fully filling his promise, the more of our historical faith is dwindling away. And it's because of this, and you'll see this even in the birth of Jesus Christ and in the ministry of Jesus, the rabbis knew that the Messiah was coming. The rabbis knew that it was going to come through a virgin birth. They did not understand it. The rabbis also knew that Jesus Christ or the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, Euphrata, and that was just five miles away from where they were positioned in Jerusalem. They did not go to verify it. Even though the king was saying, go get me word that he actually has been born, they did not bother because it had been such a long time since the prophecy had come forth that they didn't believe it anymore. The enthusiasm of his appearance. I do realize that there were a sect of people that were so excited who felt like that they were getting close to the, the coming of the Messiah that instead of when they met one another on the city streets of Jerusalem, instead of saying, hello, how's your family? How are you doing? You know, how's it going? What are you doing now? They would say Maranatha, which simply means the Lord our God, our deliverer is coming. The approaching of his presence is near us. They were excited about it. They were enthused about it. But they were the, not the ones who were in the religious order that could basically set things in motion so that it would be more receptive of Jesus Christ coming on the scene, such as it is today. We who believe in the Word of God and believe it affirmatively, we know that we wrestle against flesh and blood and powers and principalities because we pose the greatest threat to the kingdom of Satan and darkness than anyone else. If Satan is attacking you, it's because you are a threat to him. If Satan is attacking you in a certain area, that ought to be a clue to you that that area is where you're the most powerful in the kingdom of God and where you pose the greatest threat to the devil. So I want to read to you something got skewed in the process. I want to tell you that the, the reason that Jesus Christ was born through a virgin birth wasn't just because man's sins had been tainted from the very beginning. And because all of us came out of Adam's seed, according to the Apostle Paul, we are all born into sin. We are filled with the deadly toxin of sin. And James tells us that sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. But the Apostle Paul tells us in the book of Romans that sin should not have dominion over you. We're not under the domination of sin and the power. And I know that sin is still rampant in this world. But Paul tells us also that where sin doth abound, the grace of God does that much more abound. So even though we're in this world and this world is, you know, just endowed with sin, 
we're not of this world, according to 1 John, but we're from a different world, and our inheritance is coming in the future and will not be of this world, but this mortal will take on immortality and this corrupt will take on incorruptibility. But you see, my message today is the miracle before the manger. It's amazing to me that God stood in the Garden of Eden and he gave a prophecy to Eve and to the serpent and he says to Eve, out of your seed. Well, that should have been confusing because how in the world? And you can imagine how Eve's world must have been rocked beyond comprehension when out of the very first family, one brother rose up and slew the brother who was the covenant brother. Cain killed Abel. Abel was the covenant seed or would have been the covenant seed. Eve was crushed. You see some remnants of her anxiety when she saw what was going to happen because she thought, according to God's word in the Garden of Eden, she thought that redemption would come immediately. She thought that everything in her lifetime would be restored immediately. She didn't realize it would take 4,000 years. You know, she thought that, you know, pretty soon in my lifetime, I will have the son that when he will, whatever process God chooses to use, I will have a son and he'll redeem us all and get us out of the mistake that myself and my husband have made. We will be redeemed and everything will be patched up and we'll be right with God again. That was her concept. In fact, that was the concept of the entire Bible, the Old Testament prophets, the Old Testament people. But you'll find out, like I said last Sunday morning, it was always God was up there and we're down here and he's untouchable, he's unapproachable. We can't hear him, we can't see him, we can't feel him, we can't experience him. And so Job got tired of that until anxiety got so great that he said, I just wish there was somebody that could put one hand on God and one hand on me and bring me back together so that I can have communication with God. Now, in most cases, the Bible is history written in advance, especially in the Old Testament. I know that doesn't make sense. But God actually prophesied things that would come to pass hundreds, even thousands of years before they would come into fruition. And when they came into fruition, the Bible would say, you know, that's it. So the Bible, in many cases, is history, you know, in advance. You're giving us what's going to take place. And when you look back, you know, we remember what God said, but when it takes place, there it is exactly. So God, God advanced us. He gives us a word of knowledge before we needed that revelation as it came into our lives. But I want to share some things with you that you perhaps may not know. And I don't know that I'm a scholar, but I do spend much, much time reading every day. I just, it's, it's my commitment to you as a pastor if I'm going to, give you the word I got to know the word and I want to share some things with you that I feel like that you may not know but and 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 but it it will it will it will actually answer some questions why God had to give a virgin birth other than just man's sins were toxic I want you to look at with me in Matthew chapter 1 verses 18 through 22 but before you do that I want you to look at verse 11 didn't plan to do all this, and I, I know I definitely will run out of time, but look at verse 11. And Josias begot Je Jeconias and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. That uh, is not a truth. It is a truth, but there's great oversight. Now let me explain myself to you. Matthew is a Jew writing to the Jews to convince the Jews that Jesus indeed is the Jewish Messiah. That's his whole point. Matthew also is being anatomically correct by giving you the lineage. You may get bored with reading, and this one begat that one, and that one begat that one. But Matthew is doing something that no other writer wrote. Other than Luke, he's probably the most polished writer that we have. He gives us in detail. Now, I want you to see something here. Matthew was probably in his late 50s when Jesus called him to enter into the ministry and be his disciple. He's not someone, even though he is of Jewish uh, background, 
and he has all the Jewish teachings from the rabbis and the priests, he still is not someone who has been influenced up to this point by the Holy Spirit until the Holy Spirit touches him after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and ascension into heaven. Is he inspired by the Holy Spirit to give us a record of the gospel according to Matthew concerning the acts and the life of Jesus Christ? So it's important that you understand that Matthew is doing something. He wants to be all-inclusive. He is showing no biasness on his part, no partiality. And even though he's trying to, with great authority and with great research and background, he does something out of character with all the other people who are in that day who are giving to us living proof of the genealogy of their heritage. And this is what Matthew does. Matthew does the unconscionable, he does the unthinkable, he does the unmentionable. He includes women in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Which automatically, to the rabbis and to the priests, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and especially the Sanhedrin, his book is null, nullified and void because he has included women. But if you didn't have Ruth, and if you didn't have Rahab, and if you didn't have Deborah, and if you didn't have these others, you would have no true line of the royal kingdom of Abraham, Jacob, and David. Now bear in mind that the Messiah had to come from Abraham, Jacob, and David for them to come forth and basically vouch that they indeed were the worthy person to be the royal king of Jerusalem. But something happens in verse 11. In verse 11, what happens is, is that three generations are skipped. I'm sorry it's taken me all this long to tell you, but three generations are skipped. And because they are skipped is because God cursed them. God cut them off because of a dastardly deed that they did. The three that were cut off were the three that were cut off just before the king of Egypt comes and and raids Jerusalem and takes away Jehoiakim, takes him away and takes him into Egypt as a prisoner. Or, excuse me, Jeho Jehoahaz. Takes him away, and you don't hear any more about him. And then there is his brother that comes in and takes his place, which is Jeconiah. Jeconiah, Jeho Jehoahaz actually reigns for three months and ten days, and God was so disgusted with him that he anointed the king of Egypt, the Israel's Israel, to come up and basically raid Jerusalem and take away the king. And then the king of Egypt appointed the next successor over Jerusalem, meaning that they still had controlling power and interest over Jerusalem while they were still in Egypt. So he allowed Eliakim, which was Jeho Jehoahaz's brother, and they changed Eliam's name or Eliakim's name to Jeconiah. And Jeconiah became king of Israel. Now, when he became king of Israel, the, the thing that is really, really just you don't understand is Josiah was these two characters' daddy. In all the Bible, nobody was more loved. Now, I know that King David, I know you'll make an argument. But King David, basically, he kind of fit in the shoes because he had a man that anointed him three different times to be king, who kept Israel, even though Saul was out of whack and lost the anointing and the spirit was lifted from Saul, Samuel pretty much kept Israel at bay in a relationship with God. But when Josiah came on the scene, he had followed a long line of men who had missed God miserably. Josiah was the greatest king that served God and restored Israel prior to the Babylonian captivity and they go into silence and go into captivity for over 500 years and the, you know, then comes the Roman Empire and then comes all the other empires to succeed the Roman Empire. Josiah was the last great king. He was a godly man. He was a good man. He was loved by everybody in the nation. He was even loved, revered, and feared by all the other surrounding nations and kings. But when he died, his two sons became king and Jehoash messed things up so miserably that God only allowed him to serve three months and ten days. He sent the king of Egypt to take him out of commission. We don't know what he did other than he just did evil so abhorring to God that God said, I'm not going to put up with this. 
And then Jehoiakim came along, and he was worse. So God anointed Nebuchadnezzar, a heathen king, to come on the scene. Now this is the reason, this is, this is another reason why God had to choose a virgin birth. Jeho, Jehoash and Jehoiakim defiled the lineage of King David and Abraham so greatly that God cursed them. He cursed them and said, no one from this lineage, from this seed, will ascend to the throne ever again. I will not permit it. I will not allow it. It will not happen. I will not allow it to take place. Now read with me. I'm just kind of giving you, and, and you know, the outline is there. And if I know it's on Facebook. You can pull it up. But I'm, I'm running short on time. And, uh, you know, I, I want to be able to cover as much as important as, uh, as I can. Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 22, verses 28 through 30, he talks about that they're cut off. God absolutely is not going to allow anybody from Jehoash's family to come on the scene or, and, and, and Jehoiakim. It says, Je, 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 Jeremiah 22, 23, is this man, Coniah or Jeconiah, a despised, a broken pot, an, ab, an object no one wants? Wherefore are they cast out? He and his seed and are cast into a land which they know not. O oh, earth, earth, earth. Now, whenever you hear a word repeated twice in the Bible, that's prophetic. It means that God is about to do something. Mark this down. Remember how many times Jesus said in the four Gospels, truly, truly, I say unto you, or verily, verily, I say unto you, or Simon, Simon, Satan has desired you. It's prophetic. God is about to give you a prophetic message. Regardless of whether you take heed to it or not, it is going to come to pass. But it becomes something more insufferable when God says something three times in succession. O oh, earth... Earth, earth, you better run for the hills. You better Katie bar the door and batten down the hatches because it's not good news. It is a judgmental warning. I have tolerated what you're doing is insufferable that what you have done to the past, you have no regard or no respect or you have become indignant in my eyes and I'm about to judge. That's what this means. Oh, earth, earth, earth. In other words, what? Jehoiakim was doing, or uh, Je Jeconiah was doing, and Jeho Jehoash has done, that is so insufferable that he has, or they have caused the entire nation, God's promised seed and covenant people, he has, God has cursed all of them because they have all been exposed and become partakers, and no one is lamenting. That's why Jeremiah, 50 years later in the book of, of Jeremiah, he writes, is there no bomb in Gilead? And then he also said, is there not? He says, I looked, I looked for a man that would stand in the gap and make up the hedge, but I found no one. In other words, these two men had led the children of Israel astray, and nobody cared. God says, I can't even find a preacher. I can't find anybody who knows the word of God who will be sound enough and solid enough in their faith that they'll stand up and say, this is not right. And then he says, then later on he says, break up your fallow ground and find the old paths. Go back to the way that we were taught that made us the great and mighty and powerful and blessed nation that we were. Now let's put it all together. God says, nobody... Nobody out of the seed that exists that is existing right now. No, let me go back. Thus saith the Lord, write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper sitting on the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. When God spoke this through Jeremiah, it made the prophets mad. It made the kings mad. It made all those in government mad because... They thought, okay, if anybody's going to be blessed, we are. And, it, and they had this attitude, God is going to bless us no matter what because he's trapped. He can't lie. He cannot promise Eve something and not follow through with it. He cannot go wait 1,200 years later and meet a man in Ur of the Chaldees named Abram and said, I want you to leave this place and go to a land that I will show you, which will be a land that's flowing in milk and honey. He could not have cut covenant with Abraham and literally get married to him. He married Abram because when he married Abram, when he cut covenant, when he changed his name from Abram to Abraham, and the closest thing that you can, or enunciation that you can get in the pronouncing of God is the sounding from the letter H. 
that God changed Abram to Abraham or Elohim. A lot of people call him Abraham, which he had the name of God. When you get married to somebody, you take on their name. And so not only did he marry Abraham, but he also married Sarah or Sarai. And when covenant was cut, even though Sarah was not involved in the immediate worship service, she still was the one that the seed of promise would come out of. So Sarah became Sarah, and they were married. And so the Jews were thinking, okay, there's no way in the world that God can break his promise. First he told Eve that out of her seed. And then he waited until Abraham was 100 years old, and his seed was dormant. And God had to basically anoint him so that Sarah also could become fertile and bring forth a child. Now they are set. Now the kingdom, the heritage is in line. Everything is going well. Now remember, in order for the Messiah to be exactly who he claimed to be, he had to come from Abraham, he had to come from Jacob, and he had to come from the royalty of David. The royalty began in David. Now you could be from Abraham and David. If you're not Jacob, you're not qualified. Or you could be from Abraham and Jacob, but if you're not also from the lineage of David, you're not qualified. Or, or you can just, Abraham can be your great, great ancestor and none of the other two, and you're not qualified. It's miraculous in itself for the seed line and the heritage to stay intact all the way down through the lineage. But now you come to a quandary. God gets so angry with the lineage that's going to, re, that's going to give birth to royalty, that's going to redeem fallen man. He gets so aggravated and so just angry with them, he literally curses their seed and says, nobody, nobody out of this lineage is going to come and sit forth on the throne ever again and they don't have no favor. As a matter of fact, in Genesis chapter 49, and I'm just shooting from the hip now instead of going out, and Josh, I apologize to you, but in Genesis chapter 49, in Genesis chapter 49, Jacob stands up and, and he begins, to, the anointing is coming on him. And you can see the fruition of this in Hebrews chapter 11. In Hebrews chapter 11, the Bible says, and Jacob worshiped the Lord leaning on his staff, meaning this, and it's, you have to really do research. When it says leaning on his staff, it means after he given his, had given his prophecy and he had blessed his 12 children, he was a very wealthy man. He, and he of course, received Isaac's money and, and herds and, and everything. And Isaac, of course, received from Abraham. When Abraham died, he was the richest man in the world. So here's the deal. God basically speaks to Jacob and now he has 12 sons, which are going to be the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel, which, by the way, that is very significant because those 12 sons are going to judge the Old Testament characters. We know that they have already been raptured when Jesus came out of the grave on Easter morning. He went down first into hell and he took back the keys from Lucifer, the keys of hell and death that he stole from them by deception. And we know he did this because Revelation says, I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys of hell and death. But as soon as he did that, he also went over to paradise and he preached the salvation message to all those who had died in the Old Testament righteous. They were not saved, but they died in right standing with God. They could not be saved because our Redeemer had not come forth yet and man's sins had not yet been atoned for. But God took care of that when he died on the cross and he went into the grave and was buried, and he, is, he defeated the devil, and then now he's going over. We know he defeated the devil because Colossians 2, 14 and 15 says, having spoiled principalities and powers, triumphing over them and making a show of them openly. So we know that Jesus Christ defeated the devil, and now he goes over into paradise, and he offers them the plan of salvation. They have to get saved, just like you and I have to get saved. God is not a respecter of person. Everybody that goes to heaven has to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and they have to confess their sins and they have to invite Jesus to be Lord. And when Jesus came out on Easter morning, all of those who were in paradise came out with him. We know that. That's, that's an accomplished fact. But they have not been judged yet. They're in heaven. They, you know, they're enjoying. But the time comes when we will all be judged together. There will, be the, there will be the 12, the council of 24. The Bible lets us know in Revelation. The, 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 the sons of Jacob, the 12 sons of Jacob will judge the Old Testament and they will decide what, what will be their responsibilities in eternity coming in the future. And then there will be 
the apostles and plus a couple of others that will be assigned to be the judges of you and I who live in this era. But this is what's happening. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 49 verse 10, Jacob has just prophesied and told every one of his sons, this is your inheritage. And when you study, here's a man who basically 2,300 years before Messiah comes, here is a man that's standing in front of his 12 sons and he's telling them exactly what their posterity is to be in God, their place in judgment, their place in ruler and reigning, their place in authority and the place that they will have in eternity and ruling over. Now here is, a, here is a man that's telling his 12 sons, this is what you're going to be. You're going to do more than receive a portion of land that I'm giving to you, but this is what you're going to be in the spiritual sense unto God. This is why you were born. And then the Bible says in Hebrews, and he worshiped the Lord leaning on his staff. That means that after Jacob got through prophesying he was in such a, he was in he was so enhanced with the glory of God that he literally had the ability to see into the future just as Abraham did after he offered up Isaac and the angel had to stop him the Bible says that God pulled back the curtain and he showed him Jerusalem taking place before Jerusalem even existed he showed him Calvary he showed him the temple which had not yet been erected you were not worshiping God they were not priest and prophet on that manner at that time and God showed, God showed that all, all that to Abraham. That's where he gets the name Jehovah Jireh, or I will see to it that everything I'm telling you is going to come to fast pass. And I will provide it, meaning I will in the future bring forth a Messiah that will accomplish everything that I'm promising you now. So it, the Bible is so filled with documented facts that it actually is history written in advance. So by the time Jesus Christ comes along, it shouldn't be a mystery. Now let me give you one powerful thing that God gave Jacob the ability to know 2,300 years before it happened. He goes to his fourth son, Judah. He gives to him his rod. That rod, by the way, is the same one that Isaac had, which also is the same one that Abraham had. If you'll take the rod of the Old Testament men, who were in the lineage of Jesus Christ. If you'll take that rod, starting from the very bottom of that rod, they kept it to their life, and it was just like a signet ring. Every important event that took place in their life was engraved on that cane. Can you imagine Moses standing before the Red Sea, and he has his rod, which is a separate rod now, but he has his rod. And from that moment, from the time he's, he's, he goes out into the wilderness after having killed the Egyptian soldier and he becomes a shepherd and Jethro hires him and he marries Jethro's daughter, daughter Zipporah. And he begins to record the Holy Spirit. And at some event, Exodus chapter 3 is recorded on Moses' rod. He has recorded all of the plagues of Egypt that he prays for or sticks out the rod and it comes. He records them all down. He finally comes to the Red Sea and there, it looks like it's, it's insufferable to have come out this far and, and they have no deliverance. But he has an anointing come on and says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And he points, he even records that. I mean, every important event, it wasn't just a rod that, that basically protected them and defended them against the wolves and anything that was coming to maraud against them. It was also like your family Bible that you open it up and you got your family tree and all that. It was a very significant thing that they had. It was a working tool. It was a defending tool, but it was also historical information that they could, while they're holding that staff, they could remember the most important events of their lives. You and I have the same thing except God. In the Old Testament, the male child on the eighth day of his birth, after his birth, he would be circumcised. Basically, it was a scar that reminded them that God made them a promise that their seed is protected as long as they stay in covenant with God. God doesn't do that in the Old Testament. It was a big quandary about that. Well, you know, Paul had to deal with it, and Timothy had to get circumcised when he was 40 years old, and very painful, just because people said, well, he's got to be circumcised. He's going to be our pastor. Just, there, was, there were certain things that were given to us for our, for our learning, but they were not meant to save and deliver us. 
God came in the New Testament to circumcise our heart, to touch something in our spirit that nothing else could touch. In Genesis 49 and 10, Jacob comes to his fourth son, Judah, and he gives him his cane, his rod. And he says to him something so powerful that nobody recognizes it until Jesus Christ comes along. He says, and this scepter or this rod shall not depart out of your hand until shallow comes. That's what he said. Now this is what that means. He says, this scepter will stay in your lineage, Judah. Your oldest son will get this. His oldest son after him will get that. And his oldest son, keep handing the rod down. It will stay in your family, Judah, until Jesus Christ comes on the scene. And oh, by the way, when he comes on the scene, the nation of Israel will have absolutely no governmenting powers at all. None at all. He won't have any authority. He won't have any power whatsoever. And when he comes on this, and that's why when, when the Jews wanted to crucify Jesus, they had no authority to do so. Had they killed a man without going through the Roman government, whoever put that man to death also would have been put to death. So they had to go to Pontius Pilate to get his permission to have Jesus crucified. Now watch this. The Bible lets us know 800 years before Jesus was crucified, and by the way, this is before anybody in any part of the world at that time was using crucifixion as a torturer to criminals or to, or to uh, slaves or whoever, enemies. It was 800 years prior to it was ever used. They said that Jesus Christ would be hung on a cross between two thieves. Now, let's go back to Jehoiakim being cursed. Jehoiakim is cursed. Jehoaz is cursed. Jehoiakim is carried away, or Jeconiah. Jeconiah is carried away into Babylonian captivity. God raised up Nebuchadnezzar, an evil heathen king, anointed him to come to Jerusalem and to take not only Jeconiah out of the way, but to take all of Israel out of the way because all of them had sinned. They had all betrayed and forsaken God. Nobody was worshiping God at all. Nobody. Now, they were, there was still Jeremiah there. And this is about the same time when Jeconiah was carried away. It's the same time that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was carried away. And they are the only four that give reference to God in a time of captivity. The Bible tells us that even the singers, even the minstrels, even the leaders of the worship, they were carried to the river Chabar because Nebuchadnezzar feared them the most. They were left there because that was where most of the torturing went on. And they, they jeered them and says, we heard about your king and your God. Sing us one of the songs you sing to them. And they said, how can we? We can't sing about victory when we're prisoners. And they were blinded to the fact that they were prisoners. They had basically incarcerated themselves because they had forsaken God. Anyway, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stand up in the middle of all that. And they would not bow down. And because they didn't, you know the story of the fiery furnace. The Bible tells us that Nebuchadnezzar made a decree that everybody in his kingdom, in his kingdoms that he has captured, will worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Thus, to a certain degree, God begins to turn the heart of Nebuchadnezzar. Jeconiah was allowed to go back to, Israel, to Jerusalem, but in going back to Jerusalem, he came back and he was for the next three years. Now, this is old in the Bible. You can find it in 2 Chronicles. You can find it in 1 Kings. For the next three years, he's to be a servant of Nebuchadnezzar living in Jerusalem and pay tribute to Nebuchadnezzar. He does that for a while, but he, he, doesn't, he doesn't obey. He doesn't fulfill. So he's come back, and when he comes back, Jeremiah is the preacher at this time. He's preaching in Jerusalem. They have no real leader. So Jeremiah is just, the reason he's tormented so much by people is because he's prophesying things that they don't want to hear. Okay, so he's prophesying all these things that's happening to us. He said, we deserve this because we've disobeyed God and we've turned our hearts on God, our back on God. And so Jeconiah commands Jeremiah stands in the city and he reads the word of God. And while he's reading the scroll, Jeconiah is cutting the scroll off and he's putting it in a burning pot and he's burning the word of God, thinking, okay, I am demolishing this word. We're going to get rid of God, Jehovah, once and for all. That's his attitude. No wonder God's mad at him. So this goes on, and finally, after 11 years, Nebuchadnezzar, I mean, Jeconiah stops paying tribute. 
he welches on the deal. He's glad to get back to Jerusalem, but once he gets back to Jerusalem, he thinks the Nebuchadnezzar is going to forget all about him because he's too busy ca capturing the world. He's not going to think about me. Well, what he didn't realize is that God was the one that sent Nebuchadnezzar to begin with to judge him. So Nebuchadnezzar comes again. Eleven years later, he comes again, and this time he kills Jeconiah. And he drags him through the street on, on, with a donkey, leaves him outside, and he, the word prophets, the Bible says this, let the frost fall on him, but let the heat fall on him, but nobody, and when he has decayed, then you will bury him like a dead donkey. And God says, nobody out of his seed, nobody out of his seed will ever sit on my throne. Now that complicates things. So you get to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 through 22, God had the answer. For a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. He shall be great and he shall save many people from their sins. And that shall call his name Emmanuel, being interpreted God with us. To some degree, that's not an exact quotation, but that's pretty much, that's one of the translations. So the reason, now let me say this. Joe's Jesus is the legal heir to the royal throne of David but he is not the literal son of Joseph. The reason God chose Joseph, generations, countless generations, after 800 years after it had been cursed, the rabbis were absolutely just confused about it. But the reason God chose Joseph is because he was pure in heart. The Lord, the angel came and says, don't be afraid to take this woman to be your wife because that which is in her is holy. So it became a supernatural miracle. We know this for Jesus to be born. But I want you to understand, not only did Jesus realize that man's sin had now been tainted because they yielded to the serpent in the garden, but beyond that, God saw. I want you to see this. God sees 3,300 years later that the royalty that he would start 12 year, 1,200 years after the, after the Garden of Eden through Abraham, that royalty, that kindred relationship, that covenant would be so tainted that it won't just be the seed, it's now the people that are part of that lineage. I cannot allow the Messiah to come forth out of this seed, out of this abhorring act of idolatry and ungodliness. I abhor it. I curse them. They will never have any worth or any value or any longevity on this earth or in life. And it puzzled the rabbis. It's almost like they ignored them. The only real turn of what the rabbis thought and believed, you find it in Nicodemus. John chapter 3, and the Bible said, And Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, and he said, Master, we know that our Rabboni, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, lest no man. Now what that means is we know that you're not of a natural seed. We know that everything about you is supernatural. We know that everything you say, we know that everything you do, I'm the only one that's coming forth to admit this and to praise you and to admire you and esteem you highly as a gift from heaven to us. But we know that no man can do the things that you're doing except he have God in him or be God himself. That's exactly what he said. Now let me tell you something about Bethlehem. Micah says, Thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be small, you shall be less. And he talked about that. He says, You shall be of the ages. Come from the ages of past. And there's two things he's saying here. First of all, when he said, Thou Bethlehem there were two Bethlehems existing in our history at that time. One of them was Zebulun Bethlehem, and the other one was Bethlehem Judea. Okay? But he said, thou be small. Let me tell you how small Bethlehem. Of all the places, of all the places that Jesus could have been born in the world, in order for his to be absolute affirmed, why Bethlehem? Because it was the most unrecognizable city or town, if you will. It wasn't even a city, town or village in all of Judea. The most smallest. The least populated. And God chose the least to bring forth the mightiest. 
when there are two occasions in the Bible where a census was taken, and in both occasions, because Bethlehem was so small, it was not even recognized as a town or even a village, both times it was deliberately and intentionally overlooked. It wasn't even included in the census. Thus, it fulfills the prophecy of Micah 800 years before it even took place. That's amazing. You may not be of value to anybody else, but you are to God. Now, let me close this with a couple of more statements. 332 prophecies had to come to pass at the birth, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 2,000 basic, but 332 concerning the birth of Jesus Christ. Peter Stoner is one of the greatest mathematicians that the world has ever known. Peter Stoner, in the 70s, late 60s, early 70s, he made this statement. He says, in order for 332 prophecies to be given concerning one man, it's beyond impossible. It's unconscionable to think that one person could accomplish such a feat. But he said this. He said, if you would take the entire state of Texas, cover it two feet deep in silver dollars, the whole state of Texas, on the back of that one silver dollar, mark an X. Then take a man and blindfold him and put him randomly somewhere in the state of Texas and tell him to go until he thinks he has found, dig one time and find the absolute dollar that has a marked X on the back of it. The chances at one man being able to do that is 1 in 10 to the 17th power are 10 plus 17 zeros. I can't even mention that. A few years later, some of the followers and, and students of Peter Stoner, they came up and they said, okay, if Jesus or God or a man could accomplish 48 of those prophecies, he says the possibilities of them, him being able to do that would be 1 in 10 to the 157th thousand, 57th power, or that's 10 plus 157 zeros. It's just impossible. It can happen. There's no way. But I tell you this morning, Jesus Christ fulfilled, not only fulfilled them, but to exact timing and prophecy of 332 prophecies given by countless prophets, priests in the Old Testament. He fulfilled them. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, And when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem those that were under the law. Something far greater than the manger in Bethlehem. A miracle took place over a period of 4,000 years, setting us up as a generation who would live under grace, a dispensation that still exceeds today and has been for 2,000 years. Now we can come boldly to the throne of grace. It began in the manger in Bethlehem, which, by the way, is prophesied. You know, even where he was buried, one prophet said he would be buried among the rich people. Joseph of Arimathea loaned his grave. You don't loan your grave to anybody. But because he also was of the, of the Sanhedrin, was also a, like Nicodemus who believed but did not come forth until after Jesus' death, and he came forth and participated with Nicodemus and taking Jesus down off the cross and giving him the proper burial that he deserved. He loaned Jesus his grave because he knew it would be there just for a short period of time. The Bible is filled with golden nuggets that we relish. I celebrate Christmas because I can't think of Christmas. I don't, I, we need to look past the manger and see the cross where Jesus made the greatest acclamation. Jesus made the acclamation once and for all, the same acclamation that was made by every high priest in Jerusalem on Yom Kippur. He would climb the 28 steps. He would take the lamb that was chosen to be the lamb that would be slain in public before all those who came for worship that day. He would slit the throat. He would catch the blood in the basin. Then he would raise the knife and he would raise his voice, and in the Hebrew tongue he would say, It is 
finished. When Jesus shouted aloud from the cross of Calvary, it is finished. Job's cry was finally heard. A a daysman had finally come. Someone who came from God, someone who would not be completely of heaven, and someone who would not be completely of earth. Jesus was God rolled up in the flesh. He was very much God, but he was very much man. But yet, he had the respect and he had the approval from both sides to represent us. The Bible says we do not have a high priest that cannot be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. Let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Stand with me, please. I'm so thankful today. I'm so thankful today that I have the ability to approach the mercy seat without guilt. I'm so glad today that I can call on the name of Jesus because I wasn't worthy, but he made me worthy. There's so many other things. The rabbis were confused. The rabbis were so confused and so unbelieving that when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, five miles away, they didn't even make the attempt. It took wise men more than two years to take the journey from a far country. Now, how did they know to, to, to know? How did they know that the day star had come, or the day spring had come, or or the day's men had come? You know how they knew. They were called. Many people call them the magi. They seemed magical, and they were. They had great powers. But they also were captured along with Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the time of Babylon captivity. And they were so intrigued, more than likely, most Bible scholars will tell you, and you have to get deep to get this, most Bible scholars will tell you that when Daniel was called in, after the writing was on the wall, many, many tikel you farsum, and all the sorcerers, and all the magicians, and all those who practice witchcraft, Nebuchadnezzar called them in and says, either you interpret this or I'm going to kill you all. It is believed that the descendants of the wise men that came and worshipped Jesus, it is said that they are descendants of those magis who had been, they were so impressed because Daniel went in and the king says, can you write this? And my understanding, my thinking is, sure I can, that's my father's writing. And he interpreted to the exact detail. He says, this is what the interpretation means because of your evil deeds. Tonight the kingdom will be taken from you and divided in half. Go to Persia and Assyria and you won't have it anymore. It came to pass. And the amazing thing is because God's hand was so greatly upon Daniel that through five different kings of the Babylonian captivity, Daniel kept his posterity, his position, and his respect during the 70 years he was in captivity. What a man of God. But he lets us know. And so... When the star appears, and the Bible says the star came. Can you imagine this? Of all of the countless stars, and the Bible says that God knows every star and calls every one of them by name. But this star that had not been in the cosmos suddenly appeared. And it went and stayed over the place, hovered over the place. The word hovered there is the same word as the Holy Spirit hovering over the Virgin Mary and putting the Son of God inside of her womb. Same word. So God himself came and hovered over the place where Jesus, as if he's watching over. And they saw it, and it took them two years to get there. Heathen men, who are not as familiar with the word as the rabbis were, traveled a distance that took two years, while the rabbis, who were supposed to be representing God, couldn't go five miles. Our miracle is in front of us. Everything we need is always at face reach. The Bible said, if thou shalt believe, thou shalt confess, and shall have what you desire in your hearts, if thou shalt not doubt. You see, whatever we need is available to us because of Jesus Christ. The manger is just the beginning. It's just the beginning. But there was a miracle before the manger that set all this in motion that gives us the reason to have faith and hope today. Bow your heads with me, please. I apologize for taking long, but it's just too good to quit. 
Anybody need prayer today? Anybody need anything? Somebody says that Christmas is the time of miracles, and the reason they say that is because more people turn to Christ and praise Him and, and have joy in their heart. And, you know, whenever we have joy toward heaven and toward God, and it, it, it may be more commercialized than it is spiritual, but anytime the masters recognize it's going to enhance his presence and the likelihood of him showing up in our lives. That's why people say miracles are always happening at Christmas because we do things to provoke his presence. Bow your head with me. Father, I thank you today for your blessings. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you that you can speak something 6,000 years ago and it come true. You watch over it and you hold it up until it comes to pass and then you establish it in our hearts that we realize you are sovereign. You are control. You are God. I thank you for that word. It's infallible. It's without error. And I thank you for it, Holy Father. Now I ask you in the name of Jesus as we celebrate your coming to this world this year. I pray that we'll recognize in our hearts the manger was the beginning, but something far greater, something miraculous. And that something miraculous was the Holy Spirit to come later. And all of a sudden the day's man would be living on the inside of us, just like Jesus promised in John 16. The manger is the beginning, but the cross is the finality, the grave, the Easter morning, the resurrection is the finality that gives us hope. God help us to go into this Christmas season with hope, with joy, with peace and love, because it's all because of you, Jesus, and we worship you and praise your holy name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming. See you tonight at 6.30.